Great. Um, well, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers first for uh, for having me. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I hope that um, uh, that at least some people are still uh, with me at this hour and that I'm not just keeping you from the bar. Uh, so I suppose time will tell. Um, but yeah, so the title of my talk is Tracing the Developmental Origins of Population Level Structural Asymmetry of the Cerebral Cortex. Um, so the rationale behind the study is that Asymmetry in the anatomy of the cerebral cortex, in terms of cortical thickness and cortical surface area, is known to be a central organizing feature of the brain. Um, but there's actually very little consensus on these basic cortical asymmetry types in humans, example, uh, especially for cortical thickness, uh, asymmetries in cortical thickness. There's many conflicting results reported. Uh, so, for example, here take two studies. Uh, each seem to be saying that um, that these lateral parietal regions are leftward asymmetric in terms of thickness. Uh, but this one's saying that medial frontal cortex is leftward asymmetric. This one's saying medial frontal uh, prefrontal cortex is rightward asymmetric. Um, and neither of these bear any particular strong re resemblance to what we now what we now think is the true pattern of cortical asymmetry in the brain, whereby these frontal regions uh, show uh, leftward asymmetry and uh, posterior regions show rightward asymmetry. Um, um, because this was a, a population level mapping of, um, of cortical thickness and area asymmetry at low resolution. Um, so you can see straight away that uh, these, these parcels, this parcel based approach, I mean, it uses uh, often quite large parcels. And you can think that um, if there exists uh, multiple uh, asymmetries of different direction within one of these parcels, then um, the, the average asymmetry calculated across a parcel will be um, uh, reduced or changed. Uh, and also this would sort of get in the way of finding things that associate with this. Um, so uh, to sum that up, these cortical atlases uh, that are often used to assess cortical asymmetry, uh, we predict fit, uh, fits rather poorly to the asymmetry of cortex. Um, so we need this precise delineation of cortical asymmetries for the precision mapping of, of factors that uh, moderate them, such as genetic factors and, and otherwise. Um, in addition, uh, cortical asymmetry uh, is has now been confirmed to be subtly altered in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders such as autism, uh, but also aging and Alzheimer's, which suggests that altered asymmetry at, at different lifespan stages may be important for brain health. However, we have actually no idea how cortical asymmetry develops across life in health uh, because there's no normative reference for that. Um, so this is the this is the uh, space that this paper is operating in. Basically, the field lacks a high resolution reference for cortical asymmetries that reliably reproduce across international samples, um, what, what we call them population level asymmetries. Um, we're lacking a normative reference for how it develops and changes throughout life in the healthy brain, including, for example, whether asymmetries may develop together uh, within individuals, certain asymmetries. Uh, and whether um, it's attributable to genetics, i.e. how heritable uh, these, uh, these are. Uh, and also there's, there's no large scale investigation of these factors that we all sort of assume might relate to uh, structural asymmetry in the brain, such as age, cognitive ability, handlers, and sex, that actually uses regions of cortex that are asymmetric. Um, so, uh, in terms of the methods, uh, we started by doing a vertex-wise delineation of aerial and thickness asymmetry, basically flipping the data from the one hemisphere to the other and directly comparing it across the brain. Uh, did it in seven international data sets using linear mixed models and delineated the overlapping effects uh, in cortical thickness and cortical surface area asymmetry uh, from these data sets. Um, we charted developmental and lifespan trajectories using generalized additive mixed models. Um, this isn't really important apart from to point out that we have really dense longitudinal data, uh, lifespan data in, uh, in these models. Uh, so for example, we have up to 4,000 scans, but 70% of them are longitudinal in nature with up to six time points uh, per person. Um, uh, we also assessed heritability using both twin data that you can get in the Human Connectome Project uh, and also genome-wide SNP data in the UK Biobank. Uh, we have about 31,000 people. And for to test asymmetry associations uh, with cognition, we use the principal components across the 11 cognitive tests that are in the UK Biobank uh, and also associated with uh, handedness as binary variable, uh, sex and brain size in, in uh, 37,000 uh, people. 
Um, it's just an overview of uh, the samples. I'm not going to go into that in uh, too much detail. It's just that um, uh, we have uh, sort of the smallest sample was 160, um, uh, but most samples are very well powered right up to the, the full UK Biobank sample that we extracted the brain data for as well. Um, so onto the first set of results, we have a beautiful replication for um, the aerial asymmetry of the brain. Again, warm colors indicate leftward asymmetry, uh, blue colors indicate rightward asymmetry. Um, lots of these uh, fit with, um, uh, with, with uh, pre previous research as well. And um, uh, these maps all correlated at no less than 0.89. So we have this great replication across the seven data sets that allows us to actually delineate the regions of cortex that are asymmetric. Um, and yeah, um, so we see these, uh, the, the largest asymmetries are in these super marginal uh, regions uh, extending down into the quantum temporality, these leftward asymmetries and the rightward asymmetry in the lateral parietal cortex and also anterior insula, leftward asymmetry in the anterior insula is an important one to keep in mind. So we use these to then define robust aerial asymmetries. For the thickness asymmetries, we again see a really nice replication uh, across uh, data sets. Um, where we see in great detail this time this uh, this uh, anterior to posterior left right uh, thickness uh, asymmetry organization, um, and particularly the larger data sets find the leftward asymmetry in the frontal cortex as well, which is not picked up on these smaller data sets. But at these and, and obviously we see you know very well known asymmetries such as the superior temporal uh, sulcus uh, thickness asymmetry. Um, uh, again, these maps correlated pretty highly, although HC HCP was a little bit of an outlier, probably because it's it's processed the, or it's collected at a different resolution. But most other data sets correlated like really high at like 0.9 with each other or something like that. So um, then this allows us to delineate them, um, which we did here, basically showing that um, the colors here represent like how many data sets we found uh, with, with overlapping effects at a given threshold for aerial asymmetry. Uh, the leftward asymmetries and the rightward asymmetries, and for the thickness asymmetries, leftward and rightward. Um, and you see red here indicates 100% overlap at this effect uh, uh, between these data sets, uh, which is great for area and also uh, for thickness asymmetry, I say less in these frontward, leftward asymmetric regions. But in general, we have a pretty great basis to, to, to take these asymmetries uh, that we've delineated and, and do some uh, cool analysis with them. Um, so we were interested in the development of these asymmetries. So we extracted those asymmetries from uh, the lifespan sample that, that we have, which covers data from four to 89 years of age. Um, and straight away, um, so dark, uh, dark trajectories indicate the left hemisphere trajectories, and these are the leftward asymmetries because they're in yellow. Um, straight away, we see that the asymmetry is kind of stable uh, throughout life through lots of in lots of these. So it, it's stable through cortical expansion and development and also aging associated change. There's a little bit of wiggliness in sort of the smaller clusters. But in general, I think the data is kind of showing that that the, these trajectories are, are rather parallel, indicating that asymmetry is maintained. Um, and when we take indeed the average across these leftward asymmetries and plot it, we see that, yeah, um, we have very stable aerial asymmetry, leftward aerial asymmetry here uh, across life. Um, and also for the rightward aerial asymmetries, we see very similar results, lots of stability um, also through aging associated change. Uh, and again, plot the, plot the average across these and uh, we see again, it's stable. So the, the good news is that um, even though as, as we get older, uh, the cortex is obviously deteriorating and shrinking, uh, you may be as asymmetric in aerial asymmetry as you ever were, or as at least you were when you were four years old. So that's, that's nice. Uh, slightly worse news when it comes to thickness asymmetry. Um, a lot of these, uh, so the trajectories of thickness asymmetry kind of often show this developmental differentiation whereby it's minimal in infancy and grows to around about a maximum, normally around about age 25, before it then tapers off uh, in aging. Um, so you see it here, for example, um, these trajectories are typically a bit more variable. Um, but again, when you plot the average, you really see this, this nice developmental differentiation of thickness asymmetry and aging associated decline. 
um, which I think indicates that this is, or this may be a plastic form of, uh, of brain organization shaped through experience dependent plasticity. <clears throat> Uh, again, for the rightward thickness asymmetries, these are the trajectories of the individual clusters. You see the developmental differentiation even better um, with these rightward asymmetries. And again, you take the average and plot them. So the slightly worse news is that thickness asymmetry does indeed taper off as, as you get older. But we show for the first time that there's this developmental differentiation um, whereby the brain is becoming asymmetric as it, as it specializes. And so this would be really cool to follow up on to, to find out what actually what actually underlies that. So then we asked whether these asymmetries actually correlate uh, within individuals, which may suggest that these are asymmetries formed under common genetic or developmental influences. Um, so quite simply plot the uh, correlation matrix in uh, one of these samples. We see that, um, so here positive, um, sorry, Warm colors indicate uh, asymmetry, asymmetry associations, uh, regardless of direction of asymmetry in the cluster because of the way I've treated the data. Um, so in general, we see that, you know, lots of these asymmetries don't correlate. It's quite, it's quite independent. But when we look across other data sets, uh, we see this actually near perfect replication whereby these matrices replicated at no less than 0.97 correlation. Um, um, and we do see some regions that stick out as correlating stably across data sets. Uh, so for example, if we look at what this one is, this, is, this shows that uh, more leftward asymmetry in uh, this supermarginal region relates to more rightward asymmetry in the lateral parietal cortex region. Um, and you can see also that these are very close in cortex, right? But they're, they're opposite in direction. Um, similarly here, uh, more leftward asymmetry in this uh, inferior frontal region relates to more rightward asymmetry in this inferior frontal region that are also right next to each other, but it's the opposite direction asymmetry. So uh, in general, this uh, data suggests that we were able to detect a covariance structure between aerial asymmetries that nearly perfectly replicated, in which it showed that asymmetries, aerial asymmetries are typically quite independent or weakly correlated. But we do detect some that reliably correlate uh, within individuals, suggesting that these may develop together, possibly under common developmental uh, genetic or developmental influences. And they suggest that individuals who are more left lateralized in regions that should be are more right lateralized in regions that should be. Um, yeah, and that these regions are nearby. So same question for thickness asymmetry. Um, check the uh, covariance matrix between uh, the three different largest data sets. Again, we see a replication whereby we see this very strong pattern that comes out in the, in the UK biobank data, uh, but we also see it to a lesser degree, but it's definitely there in the LCBC and the HCP data. And I'll walk you through what this uh, indicates. This means that basically the um, warm regions here indicate that uh, leftward and rightward thickness asymmetries uh, correlate positively with one another, one another. So these, so higher leftward asymmetry in the, this region relates to higher leftward asymmetry in another region that's leftward, and same with the rightward. But the the uh, negative associations are arguably more interesting because they suggest that individuals who are more left lateralized in regions that should be are less right lateralized in regions that should be. Strictly, that's what the negative correlation suggests. Or the alternative explanation could be that more left lateralization in these leftward thickness regions relates to more left lateralization in regions that should be rightward asymmetric. And actually, the data seems to indicate that that is the interpretation of this. So I, I saw that, we saw that um, correlation metrics in, in UK Biobank and thought, okay, that looks like a global effect. Um, so we did a principal components analysis and found this very strong single component explains uh, nearly 22% of the variance across all thickness asymmetries in, in the UK biobank data, um, which, is, uh, uh, which uh, indicates possibly a global effect. And again, if we plot the mean leftward asymmetry across leftward asymmetries and the mean rightward asymmetry across rightward asymmetries against the symmetry lines, we see that actually the interpretation of this may be that if you're strongly left lateralized in regions that should be left lateralized. You're also left lateralized in regions that should be right lateralized and vice versa. 
Um, and uh, I'd say that this is uh, pretty uh, exciting to find a correlation that's this strong in, in 39,000 people. Um, so um, I, I'd be interested to hear the uh, possible interpretations, but we, uh, we interpret it as uh, potentially it suggests that there's high directional variability of global thickness lateralization in the population, um, which may fit into this framework whereby thickness asymmetries are, are, are plastic uh, or formed through developmental randomness. Um, uh, and that then leads people to, um, to become lateralized in different directions uh, uh, through developments. But the question is, is, is this genetic? Um, uh, we did heritability analysis and uh, I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail, uh, but um, just notice that there's lots of colors on this slide, which suggests that there's lots of significant hits for aerial asymmetries and that leftward anterior insula sticks out by far as being the most heritable region that we were able to pick up at 19% SNP heritability. And this was also significant in the twin base analysis. Um, and so we checked this with a cortex-wide analysis in the twin data of HCP and the UK Biobank data of the heritability of aerial asymmetry. Straight away, you see that the maps are very similar. And what's cool and interesting about this is that, first of all, we show that, yeah, okay, anterior insula is the most heritable uh, asymmetry in the brain that, uh, that, uh, uh, at 19%. Uh, we, we found that also in the cortex-wide analysis. But all these regions, the anterior insula, the um, uh, supermarginal gyrus and superior temporal gyrus, they all represent the regions, the first uh, cortical asymmetries that are found in utero. Um, so it, this makes sense. So we have this nice replication of the heritability maps uh, between uh, these different methods, um, suggesting moderate heritability, of course, it, which also does indicate that there's still a lot of developmental randomness. Um, uh, yes, so aerial asymmetry is moderately heritable. And when we looked at the genetic correlations between these, if you remember the, um, the correlation matrix between aerial asymmetry I previously showed where some phenotypic correlations stuck out, they're explained by genetic correlations, indicating that these are asymmetries that are formed under the same genetic influences. <clears throat> uh, for thickness asymmetry, we saw far fewer results for heritability and they didn't really match between SNP methods and twin methods. Um, Cortex-wide mapping also suggested that basically we saw very few regions that, um, yeah, that are uh, heritable strongly. These uh, black outline regions, I should have said before, indicate the FDR corrective significance, but we're also just showing the unthresholded effects so you can, uh, you can judge for yourselves uh, disregarding significance to a certain extent. And we saw that there was really no genetic correlations that, that, that existed between the, the thickness asymmetries that we detected at least. So we take from this that thickness asymmetry is only very weakly or not heritable. Um, finally, um, as lots of people here might be interested in handedness associations, we took these asymmetries and checked their associations with uh, these variables in UK Biobank. We find one hit for the handedness and the aerial asymmetry, lots of hits for sex and, and ICV, and one hit for cognition. Um, if we take the cognition hit, this indicates that uh, left, more leftward asymmetry in this region, which is interesting because this is actually the most lat left lateralized, oh, sorry, this is the most lateralized region of the brain, wherein we found that 95% of people showed leftward asymmetry related to higher cognitive ability in, 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 uh, in the UK Biobank data. It looks like a small association. It is a small association, um, but this is, you know, actually what it looks like, so you can judge for yourself. It's not like it just survived multiple comparison correction, it was a long way off. Um, uh, but it, it's a small association, but uh, it may be a, a real one. Um, I, I do not know. But also probably of, of great interest for people, lots of people here, we find that the only aerial asymmetry that we find to be associated with handedness is this anterior insular asymmetry, wherein we see left, le reduced leftward asymmetry in left-handers. But this was also the most heritable region of the brain, right, at uh, 19%. So I think that that says uh, something, uh, so, something interesting. Um, 
The thickness asymmetry, uh, again, we found one hit for reduced leftward asymmetry in somatocentric cortex in left-handers, which again, I think feeds into this uh, story of that this, the thickness asymmetries may be formed through, um, uh, through development, maybe through use-dependent plasticity, and in general, the sex effects that we see kind of um, uh, agree with what's been reported before. So uh, in sum, um, yeah, sorry, uh, in sum, uh, aerial asymmetries uh, seem to be stable throughout life, which suggests that it arises very early in life, probably in utero. Um, and it correlates in specific regions, which is underpinned by genetic correlations. This suggests that it's their fo asymmetries formed under common genetic developmental influence. Um, it's moderately, her moderately heritable, and um, whereas thickness asymmetry grows in, uh, in development and declines in aging, suggesting this may be a plastic form of uh, brain development. Um, and it also may be globally related across the brain in a manner that suggests that highly left lateralized people in left regions are also left lateralized in rightward regions and vice versa. Um, it's also weakly and not heritable. Um, so I think that these results basically speak to uh, developmental randomness in uh, the direction of thickness asymmetry, possibly through plastic mechanisms. Finally, uh, we find that these robust asymmetries are only weakly related to uh, the things that come to mind, i.e. cognition, handedness, sex and brain size in, in large scale data. Um, but in general, I think the take home is that the, these results support a prenatal, postnatal uh, developmental dichotomy for aerial, and, aerial and, and thickness asymmetry. And and what's kind of as a final point like to note is that the brains across the world seem to end up with similar patterns of, of mean asymmetry, even though the genetics explains very little inter-individual inter variation between it. So this may suggest that these um, there are genetic biases that bias the, the lateralization in, in one direction at the mean level, uh, but these may have sort of reached fixation in the population uh, in, in sort of the, the same way that maybe, yeah, I don't know, having, having two legs uh, is, uh, is highly heritable, but wouldn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to explain much inter-individual variation uh, um, in that trait um, with genetics. So um, I'll thank, uh, that's it for me. I'd like to thank my amazing supervisors, uh, Renee Westhausen and Didac Bidal Panero, uh, my research group and funders. And uh, this is the link to the preprint. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Thank you very much, James. There is one question. Oh, perhaps several questions. Hi, uh, Chris McManus from UCL in London. Hi, um, Chris. Hi. I, I'm one of the aging brains in the UK biobank study, so I have to declare an interest. Um, you said at one, I realized I wasn't quite clear what the actual measures were that you were using. You talk about thickness. Are you actually talking millimeters or something like that? Because yeah, yes. point, it's, well, it's the, the reason I say that is because you say <laughs> thickness asymmetry tapers off with age. But are you then yep. correcting that with total cortical volume? Because if the amount of cortex is diminishing because of some increased uh, CSF, then all the absolute measures will go down. So the, the difference measures will go down, but the relative asymmetry could be staying the same. That's why that's what the force of the question. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I take the point. Um, here, uh, so in a in a previous paper where we actually showed the um, the the um, aging relations with thickness asymmetry, we did do that. We we showed that this um, uh, that the decline in thickness asymmetry is uh, is relative, not not absolute. So people are losing. Um, uh, yeah, more um, yeah, uh, more cortex from, for example, the leftward uh, region uh, relative to the rightward region in terms of percent. Um, so that kind of uh, uh, answers that question. Here we didn't. Um, uh, I I don't think it's it's not corrected for ICV uh, here, but then 
um yeah no it's not corrected for icv here but we could do that we could just show that the relative that uh, that um uh, the relative change absolutely applies uh, i'm very confident of that because it wasn't even uh it, the the results were very clear in our previous paper that that that, that is the case thank you very much Thank you. If there are no other questions, then uh, thank you very much again, James, and all the other people.